Fewer contracts, fewer customers, fewer employees. That's a situation that many companies find themselves in since the pandemic. In this week's programme, we want to show you what people are doing to get out of the crisis. Welcome to our new COVID-19 special. We begin in Germany. 50,000 employees are missing in the hospitality industry. Most of them found new jobs in other sectors during the pandemic. Salmon gratin is the house specialty, but the head chef is forced to prepare it by himself. During lockdown, many kitchen staff left. To make up for the shortage, the restaurant now opens later on some days to save on the number of shifts. The hotel is hiring new staff and trainees from all over the world. Those who left are not coming back. During lockdown, they found jobs in other sectors. It's really noticeable. We've had to change our schedules and reduce our a la carte menu. In our kitchen, we cook everything fresh, so we can't offer as many options as we'd like. And we have to rely more on inexperienced staff. That's the problem we're dealing with. And I don't know any kitchens that aren't looking for staff. But we have to somehow make the best of the situation. For the hotel's owner, the staff shortage means a loss in revenue. He often has to turn down large events. And he doesn't do weddings anymore, even though the demand is there. What happens if there are regular guests who've been coming to us for years and we have to tell them, I'm sorry, we just can't accommodate you? That would be terrible. I'm really sad, so are my employees, that we just can't offer certain things at the moment due to the staffing situation. Shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine, the hotel took in refugees, offering free rooms to Ukrainian women who'd fled the war. Five of them now work at the hotel. It's a chance to start a new life in Germany. Lilia Rui is now in charge of the breakfast buffet. She has big dreams. I was a cook in Ukraine. Of course, I didn't prepare German dishes. But I'd like to get to know the recipes and start cooking them. Here we mainly have men working in the kitchen. I'd like to change that and one day be head chef myself. The hotel's executive assistant is the boss's right-hand man. It's usually a desk job, but now he has to help out wherever he's needed. It's the only way to cope with the staff shortage after a fifth of the hotel's employees gave their notice. I have no problem jumping in no matter where. I like it. I can't imagine spending the whole day sitting in my office in front of a computer from 9 to 5. I need the change of pace. Lots of our staff are doing the same, helping each other out. To retain staff and attract new employees, the hotel ensures that everyone gets two days off after five days on the job. They're supposed to avoid overtime, and at the end of the year, everyone will get a share of the profits as well as bonuses of up to 2,500 euros for people who've been there at least five years. The head chef hopes the measures will attract new staff. And maybe some of the employees who quit during the pandemic will come back. Maybe there'll be those people who say, you know, working retail really isn't for me. Gastronomy was not so bad. It was actually quite nice. I've been in this business for almost 37 years. I don't think I'd have stayed so long if it were the worst job in the world. In the meantime, he's doing his best to help the next generation of chefs. As a member of the examination board of the Brandenburg Chamber of Commerce, he supports apprentices wherever he can. Another way of fighting back against the staff shortage. Next to Morocco. For the past six months, Morocco's borders have been open. In June and July alone, over three million tourists came to visit the North African country. All visitors had to prove that they were tested and vaccinated.
Morocco is a country with rich cultural traditions that attracts tourists in droves. And tourism is good for the economy. In Morocco, it once accounted for 10% of GDP. Historic cities, traditional crafts and beautiful architecture have made this North African country a highly desirable destination. From the desert to the coastline. That is, until the coronavirus pandemic plunged the tourism sector into an unexpected crisis. The government made some tough decisions, but although they were bad for business, they were the right ones, says the Secretary-General of the National Tourism Confederation in Casablanca. Morocco made some very brave decisions, perhaps to the detriment of certain economic indicators, but they were the right decisions for the health and safety of Moroccans and anyone on Moroccan soil. The famous Gemma El Fanar Square in Marrakesh is normally a bustling tourist magnet. During COVID times, it was practically deserted. Nationwide, the tourism industry lost the equivalent of about $9 billion during the pandemic. Vulnerable businesses like hotels received support. $220 million have been allocated so far, first and foremost to save jobs. Now there are high hopes that things will pick up again. It's a global approach to the pandemic that's now enabling a sustainable economic recovery. We're seeing a powerful resurgence in the tourism industry, no doubt about it. In Marrakesh, the tourists have indeed returned. Official statistics report that foreign exchange revenue increased by 173% compared to last year. The COVID infection rate appears to be stable as confirmed during an interview in August with Dr. Afif Moulay Saeed, one of Morocco's decision makers on coronavirus matters. According to yesterday's statistics, we had 1,600 active cases. In June last year, there were 22,000. The virus is barely spreading anymore. And as you can see, lots of tourists have returned. To make Moroccan tourism more internationally competitive, it's joined a number of countries in introducing an electronic visa. There's now less paperwork at the border for immigration. Morocco has also simplified its COVID rules for travellers. Those wishing to travel to Morocco used to need a negative PCR test, even if they had a vaccine pass. Now we've decided that people with a vaccine pass don't need a test. But the pandemic wasn't all bad for business. Domestic tourism actually increased dramatically. In 2021, it rose by 69 per cent. With foreign tourists now returning too, visitor numbers are expected to hit record levels. We still feel a little bit insecure. Uh, we, uh, like, since tourism is coming back, uh, more foreigners, Morocco has opened the borders totally to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, people from all over the world. So we're, yeah, still afraid from an, another uh, wave of uh, COVID uh, hitting Morocco. Any new surge in infections would also hit the roughly two and a half million traditional craftspeople here. At the start of the pandemic, some felt it was unfair that the tourism sector was given higher priority when it came to government handouts aimed at safeguarding jobs. But they too recognise that their income depends on a healthy tourism industry. And how do tourists feel about travelling? Are they worried about a new wave of infections? I don't think people who have had all three shots need to worry. I think COVID-19 is here to stay and will keep spreading. And we just have to get used to it and learn to live with it. This opinion appears to be widespread, and it's certainly giving Morocco's tourism industry a boost. People all over the world are trying to recover from the economic damage caused by lockdowns. Our reporter Amaka Okoye talks to a young Nigerian carpenter who's trying to rebuild her business. Bugwa runs this carpentry shop with her dad and doing so well. When COVID hit, the business reality changed, including closing a carpentry academy for girls, a project she is passionate about. 
while committed to delivering quality furniture for her clientele base. With COVID, sales decreased, but she had workers to pay. Because um, we had to fully shut down. That, that was full lockdown, so we had to fully shut down and everything. But we were particular about not letting anybody go during that period. So even during then, we were still paying salaries. But not of everyone. Me, I did not get paid. And of course, my father did get paid too. And, um, but it was more of, let's just get through this, let's survive, let's get through this, let's survive. And uh, the teaching part ended. Of course, we couldn't teach anybody. Nobody could come out to learn at that point. So it was just more of survival. COVID was horrible. That's the, the main, you know, like the beginning part of COVID. It was terrible. Nobody was thinking about buying furniture also at that point. However, more people began to work from home. Business also moved online. A little respite, at least. When you're home, you tend to see all the things that are wrong with your house. You know, your sofa is not so good anymore. So people are starting to get sofas again. Then there's the workstation. You know, everybody wants that workstation from home. So we had to, you know, you have to adapt. So we had to start doing more work tables that are great at home. Though the academy dream is now stalled, 22-year-old Adiola, an intern and university student, is glad to be here given Bugwa some hope on inspiring younger female carpenters. It's become a thing of comfort and something I do to, to just <laughs> relieve myself and find, I find a um, purpose in it. I'm more about making do my hands than sit down somewhere and have to do paperwork or <laughs> anything related to that. Bugwa experienced a decline in her customer base as less people wanted furniture or had plans for long-term furniture, but it gave them time to utilize wisely available resources. COVID taught me resource management because we did not know how prices are skyrocketing on every form. And um, so we just learned that we have to manage the best that we can, still optimize quality and then put that out there. Bugwa says her dream for the academy is not entirely lost as she plans to have more girls interning and learning to become carpenters like her and grow her customer reach across states and internationally. Some sectors experienced a boom during lockdown, like the book trade in Colombia. That's ironic considering that according to the OECD, Colombia has one of the lowest reading levels worldwide. On average, Colombians used to read fewer than two books a year. But that changed during the pandemic. At the age of 22, in the thick of lockdown and stuck at home, Gabriela Parra started reading books. And thoroughly, too, with notes in the margins and sections underlined so she wouldn't forget anything. In 2020, I think I read about 40 books. In 2021, I read 60. And so far this year, I've read 48. Having studied mathematics, Gabriela Parra loves numbers. But during the pandemic, she developed a passion for literature. She doesn't keep the books on shelves, she stashes them in plastic storage bags to protect them. Mostly books from independent publishers. I find these publishers so exciting. Their unique books have created a community of readers. There's such a passion for detail that I haven't found anywhere else. And they have especially good customer service. You talk to real people, that's what sets them apart. There are 70 independent publishers in Colombia. They're little known among the general public. But during lockdown, they posted record sales. Publisher Edgar Blanco thinks that's down to their flexibility. We're always struggling, actually. We're always trying to reach our readers in different ways. So when the totally unexpected happened, the global pandemic, we were prepared. And that made our job easier. 
Books from these independent publishers give a platform to new voices on the Colombian literature scene. But during lockdown, customers couldn't browse in bookstores. Sales mostly happened through social media. It worked really well. For many, it was a lifeline because it put them in direct contact with their readers through posts on Instagram, Facebook, and even Twitter. That's how they sold books. Bookstores that were able to sell directly online also did well during lockdown. Readers could even communicate with each other on the store's websites, giving recommendations or reviews. The surprising thing was that for bookstores operating on a national or even international level, sales went up despite the fact that the doors were closed. We weren't expecting that. Social networks also helped. The selection in this bookstore comes from independent publishers. It mostly sells political books about critical thinking and social movements. The people behind these publishing houses say they're not interested in making a profit. They sacrifice on money to get lots of books into circulation, to reach a lot of people. All these great books behind me form what we call our independent corner. Gabriela Parra started reading as a child. Her favorite book is Gargoyle by Andrew Davidson. For her, books are an alternative to the Internet. I've noticed how addictive social media can be and that I need to distance myself from it. It really helps to have a book in my hand to stop me reaching for my phone. I know it's cliché, but it really does help. And to feed her healthy new habit, she needs lots of new books. And she's keen to buy lots more, if nothing else, to support independent publishers. And now to Mexico. 1.6 million people there are suffering from long COVID. But the Mexican government isn't shelling out enough money to treat the health consequences. Myra Mora fell ill with COVID-19 in August 2020, and she's still suffering from symptoms now. For a long time, many of the doctors that she consulted simply didn't believe her. The 39-year-old had to spend a lot of money seeing specialists, until finally she was diagnosed with chronic fatigue, a neurological disorder and muscle pain. My entire body was shaking. Just walking to the bathroom was a huge undertaking. I arrived completely exhausted and had to shower sitting down. I still have days where I shower sitting down because of exhaustion. Her partner takes care of most of the housework. Although Myra has made a good recovery, she still needs help with many everyday tasks. Her breakfast consists of a cocktail of drugs and she's by no means the only one. At least she has a partner to help. Many in Mexico feel left alone with their problems. Cesar Medina also has long COVID. After losing both his job and his partner, he set up a self-help group. No one's talking about these things, about what can happen. And so your family, partner, friends and others start to feel skeptical and think you're just imagining it. Group on Facebook now has 6,000 members. Although an estimated 1.6 million people in Mexico are suffering from long COVID, the government has not made any funds available for examinations or treatment. Cesar Medina's group works to raise awareness of the problem, particularly among government officials and departments. Medical doctor Giorgio Fagnuti believes that the apparent lack of interest among politicians has more to do with the health service not having the capacity to deal with the problem. 
que reconocerlo. Significa... All these patients really need is to be referred to the relevant healthcare systems, but those institutions just aren't in a position to deal with all the problems that arise from this illness. Mexico's public health institutions say they have treated 178,000 people for post-COVID problems and have 188 facilities that offer comprehensive rehabilitation. Psychologist Marta Lopez, who takes care of long COVID patients, assured us that multidisciplinary medical teams have been created, as well as online therapy, to target the problem. Apart from providing more medical consultations for these types of patients, long COVID rehabilitation courses have also been carried out. These courses are accessible to all, and patients can simply join in from home. But the government is still refusing to recognize long COVID as an illness. That means that public health bodies can't write patients off sick. Myra has moved house to be closer to the university where she lectures in psychology. Even so, the one-hour daily commute combined with the teaching is tough. It's three times as strenuous for her as it would be for a healthy person, and the strain is exacerbating her symptoms. You're no longer the same person, and that's hard to understand and to cope with it each day afresh, because you know your life wasn't like this before, but that during this sickness, everything suddenly changed, and now you can no longer live without help from others. Do you have a question about the coronavirus? Our science editor Derek Williams gives you the latest research and analysis. Send Derek an email by writing to covidproducer at dw.com. This week he's answering this question from Seth Underwood. Is the pandemic now claiming only as many lives as a bad flu season? A lot of experts hate comparing influenza to COVID because it paints the current epidemiological picture with a, a very broad brush and because there are so many vague factors involved in, in trying to nail down the data, starting with the fact that reporting on COVID-19 mortality has been really spotty in many places and, and complicated by factors like like clear attribution. Um, after all, just because someone is testing positive for the coronavirus when they die, it doesn't necessarily mean the virus is what killed them, especially if they're elderly patients. Um, similar problems apply to defining flu mortality. Uh, many of its victims aren't killed directly by infections with the viruses that cause influenza, but instead by the pneumonia that getting flu can lead to. Okay, I got at least some of the caveats out of the way, and you all know now how much guesswork is involved. But let's see if we can come up with some kind of an answer to your question based on the data that we do have. To start with, flu mortality. According to the World Health Organization, in the years leading up to the pandemic, influenza killed between 290 and 650,000 people annually. In really bad years, therefore, around 650,000 people died of it. Uh, now COVID. I added up the WHO statistics for weekly coronavirus deaths in 2022 and came up with around 850,000 for the first six months of this year. If you doubled that for the full calendar year, then it would add up to a prediction of around 1.7 million deaths due to COVID in 2022. So roughly three times as many as a really bad year for flu. This is, of course, oversimplified and kind of cheating because COVID-19 waves are, are dynamic and they're ongoing and they're unpredictable. Um, you might have noticed on that graph, for instance, that the most recent statistics show the global death count from the disease is currently lower than at any other time since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, since last April, COVID has only been killing between around 10,000 and 17,000 people 
worldwide every week. It's a positive trend that is at least partly due to higher levels of immunity in populations due to vaccination, previous infection, or, or both. But, but even if that positive trend were to hold steady in the future, we'd still be looking at the coronavirus causing at least as many annual deaths as the number attributed to flu in a really severe outlier year, and probably more. In our next program, we'll show you how school children from around the world are getting back to school. Are students, teachers and parents prepared? Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>